Welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, we have an interview with Brian Mir, directly from Brazil, and it's an honor for us to have him here. He has been a correspondent for Telesur English in Brazil, and he's also co-editor of Brazil Wire. Uh, he also uh, was the editor of the book uh, Gear of Lead, Washington, Wall Street, and the New Imperialism in Brazil. And he also has been living in Brazil for more than 25 years. So welcome, uh, Brian. And uh, uh, I won't just jump into the first questions, which is basically, who do you think is going to win? But taking into consideration the these recent endorsements of Gomez and Tevet to Lula, uh, and, but also taking into consideration the, the stealing of votes debate that has been arising after the first round, and also the, the religious debate within Brazil that I, I understand is very influential in people's decisions. So welcome again, and you can jump into the, into the answers. Okay, um, if the, you know, a lot can happen in two weeks. If the election were held today, Lula would win. You know, Lula won the first round by six, over 6 million votes, 6.2 million votes. It was the first time since the return to democracy in 1985 when a challenger beat the incumbent president in the first round of an election. So the media spun it as much more negative results than expected. There were some surprises. Bolsonaro did a little bit better than, about six points better than he was uh, appearing in the polls. Um, some of the gubernatorial races were, uh, the left didn't do as well as planned, but the left, you know, specifically the PT, the Workers' Party, picked up 21% increase in members of Congress and um, picked up, a, since 2019, 50% increase in Senate numbers of senators. So there was some you know, in, in general, it was positive. There were a few disappointing results like Haddad for governor. He was expected to win, uh, to lead after the first round, but he ended up uh, behind Bolsonaro's candidate. Um, but anyway, I uh, he only needed, uh, Lula only needs like 1.6 million votes to win. Simone Tebet, who came in third place, she had about 5 million votes total. Right. She's not just endorsing Lula, she's campaigning with him. She's going to campaign events. She's very enthusiastically supporting Lula. So just from her votes, even if Lula got half of her votes, it would be enough to win in the second round, okay? Ciro Gomez, unless there's a major change in the number of abstentions or something like that, right? If, uh, if a lot more people abstain, that would help Bolsonaro. Uh, Ciro Gomez has been more negative than positive. In fact, one of the explanations for uh, the surge in votes for Bolsonaro at the last minute is that Ciro Gomez's support, he was polling at like seven or 8% and he ended up with 3% of the votes. Uh, the director of one of the largest polling agencies thinks most of those went, votes went to Bolsonaro. And the reason is that Ciro spent the last, Ciro Gomez, he spent the last two months running really dirty attack ads against, Lu, against Lula instead of going after Bolsonaro. And some of these ads even use this fash wave um, uh, graphic style, which is popular with the international far right. You know, so, mm -hmm. so it's hard to say what's going to happen with his rem remaining votes, the people who did vote for him, he ended up with like 3%. But most people think it's going to split about 50-50 at this point between Lula and Bolsonaro. That wouldn't be enough for Bolsonaro to win. In terms of vote stealing, there's no evidence that any votes were stolen. Okay, What there is a lot of evidence is, is um, illegal use of WhatsApp and other social media applications targeting specific demographics with illegal campaign funding from corporate sector from, from um, bourgeoisie, comprador elites in Brazil that target, for example, evangelical Christians heavily with disinformation, such as if Lula's elected, he's gonna change all of the bathrooms in the public school system so that anybody can use them regardless of gender, 
or that he's going to close down all of the evangelical churches, right? So uh, this, is, this is causing some problems. However, it's important to remember that evangelicals are only 31% of Brazil's population. They've been Bolsonaro's main support group for the last four years. However, his support has been slipping among that demographic, despite all of the fake news campaigns Lula basically doubled support of the evangelical population for the Workers' Party through a lot of base, base uh, level organizing. You know, it's not hard to pull out lessons from the Bible and explain how Jair Bolsonaro is not acting like a Christian. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's good that you, you clarify that to me because I was wor worried about the the whole, uh, especially the, the, the voting stealing scene that has been coming up in recent days, especially after the, the first round, of course. So it's good to know that that there was no real concern on that particular issue. So, so the, you... the, the military issued a report. Bolsonaro created a special military commission with the intention that they would prove that there was some vote stealing going on because Bolsonaro is pushing this narrative that this, the electronic voting system is successible, susceptible to fraud, okay. uh, which it's never been connected with any kind of fraud um, proven, you know. And even his own com handpicked commission of military people was unable to prove one case of fraud. So the, the real fraud that's happening is manipulating the public opinion illegally using illegal tactics, but not the actual voting process. Let me jump now to the second question, which is connected to the balance of power. And, and in, in that particular area, there, there, there are different, you know, institutions that, that one has to analyze. But the ones that concerns me the most uh, is the balance of power in Congress after the elections. Uh, the first round, I mean, uh, and also the grassroots movement. How how, how strong now? How really strong uh, are the the grassroots movement in Brazil in helping uh, Lula to win? Uh, if you see a connection there, and of course the military and the media, but everyone knows uh, how it works. But anyway, it's good to hear it from someone from Brazil. Okay, well. Uh, in terms of grassroots mobilization, um, Lula has been putting hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in city after city. He was in Salvador um, the day before yesterday, over 150,000 people on the street behind him. And this is due a lot to the base of the Workers' Party, which is uh, labor unions and social movements. So the, for example, the Landless Rural Workers Party, the MST, is the largest social movement in the Americas, working, the largest working class social movement. And they have been on the streets. So, you know, for the first time in, in its history, the Landless Rural Workers Movement or MST, they fielded 15 candidates for a state and federal Congress. They've never been able to They've never tried. There have been a few incidents in the last 40 years when they've fielded one or another candidate. It's always been hard to mobilize the vote in rural areas, right? Mm -hmm. This time, they managed to put six MST members into federal and state Congress, which is a historic first. Um, and they're going to be, you know, all of those apparatus are, are canvassing for Lula right now, working for Lula. All of the vote, um, you know, all of the political organizing operations that they set up for their candidates. So in, in um, comparison, sorry to interrupt you, Brian, in comparison with those movements, uh, I mean, the, the PT machinery and the MST, the MST uh, do Bolsonaro has a counter response in, in social movements that support him? Well, if you look at the crowds on the streets, um, he's not able to put many people on the street okay, okay. like that you see some images of him in front of these huge crowds mm -hmm. these are large religious events that would have happened anyway that he appears at okay. you know so um for example the national march for jesus which is an evangelical holiday 
ironically, that was declared a holiday by Lula when Lula hmm. was president. This every year it brings hundreds of thousands of people to the streets of Sao Paulo. And so Bolsonaro appeared at that event and he's using the footage in his commercials as if that was a rally for him. His actual rallies are much smaller, but his like a lot of his support is through evangelical churches and evangelical pastors, you know. So you could say that was that that's his main support base, you know, as well as you know, military police officers and, and things like that. You know, there's no, for example, no labor unions support Bolsonaro. And listen, what about the, 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 the balance of power in Congress? That I read somewhere that he's not going, if Lula wins, he's not going to have it easy in that particular area. Yeah, this is, I think this analysis is based on a misunderstanding of Brazil's Congress. Um, uh, during the height of Lula's first government, the Workers' Party never had more than 25% of the seats in Congress, and they never had more than 14 senators out of 81 total members of Senate. Incl so with those numbers, you add on the close allies, which is the Communist Party of Brazil, PC2B, and um, this year it's the Green Party is joined as well, and Hedgy, very small parties. But... Um, even if you had all of the allies, even if you had PESOL, which is a traditional ally in Congress with, with uh, the PT, they have a total of like a, a little over 100 members of Congress in a Congress with 514 people. The important thing is that the number of Congress members increased by 21% back to the level that it was at during Dilma Rousseff's presidency. So it's hard to spin this as a negative as the, the foreign press is trying to do when they actually increased seats both in the House and in Senate. Now, when Lula was president, he had to do a lot of things by executive order, by decree. And then also he had to make alliances with center-right parties in order to govern. And this led to a lot of um, criticism from the left, from mainly. bourgeois vanguard leftists, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Brooklyn or something, but his government was neoliberal. When in fact, if you look, the political party, the Workers' Party, is much farther left than any Workers' Party government has ever been because of the need for these coalitions to govern. You know, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, Brazil has a very large middle class. You know, and if you can't um, govern the country, unfortunately, just uh, for working class in this, in this type of capitalist system that Brazil has. You know short of like an armed revolution or something like that, it would be impossible to govern without some of these center-right parties, which trace their roots back to the military dictatorship. There was amnesty for everyone, and they allowed all of Congress and Senate to remain in power after the end of the dictatorship. So they just created two new political parties, MDB, PMDB and, uh, and PFL. PFL's changed its name several times, but it's still the second biggest party in the Senate and Congress. It's called Union Brazil now. This was the official political party of the neo-fascist military dictatorship. And the official opposition party, the MDB, is the party of Simone Tebet, who just came in third, who's now supporting Lula. So um, the, the, you know, unlike, for example, Argentina, where they put former generals, you know, they put generals in jail and things like that. They, they never really fully transitioned back from dictatorship to democracy in Brazil. You can see that, in, for example, in the behavior of the military police who don't have to follow the rule of law in Brazil. They have their own internal court system, you know? So this is what makes the situation, you know, really complicated and easy to misinterpret, easy for someone who living in the United States or something who's never lived under a left-wing government to just say, oh, uh, it's neoliberal or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, that happened a lot with Lula during his first two terms. That's true. That's true. So, so the military is a, is a, is a more complex area, right? Uh, according to what you what you you were just saying, right? And me, what about media? Well, uh, let me get into the military really quick. Just. Um, mm -hmm. There was an internal, because as you know, like for the last year and a half, Bolsonaro has been threatening to hold an auto coup if he doesn't win the elections, right? Mm -hmm. So the Defense Department 
did an internal study of the military to see which branches of the military leadership would support Bolsonaro in a possible auto coup attempt. And the results were leaked to the media. And they're kind of surprising. First of all, the Navy and the Air Force would support Bolsonaro if he tries to hold a coup, okay? But the Army would not, according to this internal study. The Army is bigger than the Navy and the Air Force combined. And the other surprising thing was that um, most state military police apparatus or leadership would not support a coup attempt by Bolsonaro. Everyone thought that he had all of the police in the palm of his hand, and it doesn't look like it. And one of the police apparatus that is most anti-Bolsonaro right now is Rio de Janeiro State Military Police, which are the most corrupt and worst uh, police organization in Brazil. You know, so like he can't even hold on to his own, and he's from Rio. And he has his family has connections in the militias, which are all off-duty police officers. So it's it looks like there's some kind of internal organized crime struggle going on inside the the real military police, which isn't favoring Bolsonaro right now either. You know, so that would that was just interesting to see. Now with the media, um, I don't normally recommend or support or anything Reporters Without Borders. It has a reputation of being a CIA front group. Nevertheless. They issued a report about five years ago called um, The Land of 30 Berlusconis about Brazil's media. And the report was actually, I thought, was pretty good. Basically, you have a, a small number of very powerful elite families who control all of the mainstream media in Brazil. Um, Globo, for example, was built its television system was built during the military dictatorship in partnership with Time Warner Corporation as a means, specifically as a means of social control over the population. So they, they didn't just um, install all of these transmission towers all around Brazil and gave the license to Globo. Um, they then bought back all of the shares. They helped Globo buy back all of the shares from Time Warner two years later by giving them billions of dollars in advertising on their network. And so um, this network has always been pro, very pro-military. They only started calling the 1964 coup d'etat a coup in 2014. Before that, they, they'd always called it a democratic revolution. You know, and wow. this is the third largest open air or fourth largest open air TV network in the world. So even they have turned on Bolsonaro. You know, these traditional um, media groups like Globo, Folio do São Paulo, Estado do São Paulo, they all created the conditions for Bolsonaro to rise to power through years and years of slander and character assassination of leftists, especially Lula, but also Dilma Rousseff, PT party president Glazy Hoffman, who went to Nicolas Maduro's inauguration, you know, mm -hmm. last inauguration. Uh, people like that, they've been attacking them almost every day. And so finally, when this monster spins out of control, they, their final result wasn't someone like Bolsonaro. They were, they were looking for, as they say in Brazil, the kind of fascist who eats with a knife and a fork. They didn't want this out of control monster like Bolsonaro in power. So now they've backed off their support for Bolsonaro. They're ostensibly supporting Lula, but they're already setting the groundwork to destabilize his government to guarantee that, you know, um, they remain in control. The right wing maintains control over the macroeconomics, basically. Yes, yes, yes. This is very interesting what you are saying. You are giving me another perspective of Brazil. I mean, the elections. Uh, and and let's jump to the last question. I mean, uh, it, it is basically connected to how international developments might impact the electoral debate in, in Brazil. Not the electoral debate, the electoral results actually, but maybe also uh, the counter analysis might help. I mean, how uh, a possible victory of Lula or Bolsonaro might impact the region, at least Latin America. Well, um, I think that uh, there's this kind of full spectrum war going on against the Latin American left, right? So you get 
You get people from all sides of the spectrum attacking Nicolas Maduro. You have these people attacking Nicolas Maduro from the so-called left, but you look what what's their popular connection to the left? Nothing, you know. True. The, these um, sometimes it's like Trotskyist academics from the United States, and you have the same thing happening against Lula the entire time. Now, one thing that's been taken out of context is a few comments he's made, unfortunately, about how he believes that there should be an alternance of power in Venezuela and um, Nicaragua. These comments are always taken out of context because his main point is that it, whenever he's asked about these countries is that the people of those countries should solve their own problems. It's not my position to suggest what they should or shouldn't do. My personal opinion is this. But if you look back at the history of the relations between the Workers' Party governments and the rest of the Latin American left, in, including Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, you know, all of this so-called axis of evil of the United States, they always had very good relations. And um, I, I'd like to highlight the, the time that Lula and Hugo Chavez de defeated the free trade agreement of the Americas together. You know, yes. that was a that was important. Now, it's not uh, the one of the differences between Venezuela and Brazil, obviously, is that the military in Brazil really dislikes the left. They've never been able to, you know, um, do political formation of the military or something. So uh, I think that's very a strong thing in Venezuela's favor. But in general, I think a Lula victory would be good for um, sovereignty of peoples in Latin America, especially in South America, and um, and it would be just a move forwards for for the um, continent in general, just because it's such a big country and has such a big economic influence on, on the rest of the, the And international, imp international events impacting Brazil, do you think that that might happen? I, under I know that Brazil is like a self-centered country that is sometimes it's too isolated embedded. because of the, mm -hmm. yeah. the language isolates it, you know, even though we have these neighbors everywhere, most Brazilians don't understand Spanish, so it's unfortunate. But um, one thing that's interesting is that nobody in Brazil got on board with, nobody is getting on board with the new Cold War, right? If you look at Russia and China, even the Bolsonaro, it's not Bolsonaro himself, but it's people behind the scenes in the Brazilian State Department. They're refusing to give any kind of lip service to the United States on China and Russia, right? And that will continue under Lula. Lula is not, Lula never, when, when Bush asked Lula to, for Brazil to join the Iraq war, he said, our war is against poverty in Brazil. It's, it's against hunger. It's, we're not getting involved in other people's wars, right? And so I think it's, you know, the, the US government has been trying to put the Bolsonaro administration against Venezuela. We know that, right? Like, so it's good, it would be good for Venezuela if Bolsonaro's out. He's been doing joint military operations with the US military in Brazil near the Venezuelan border as a kind of intimidation tactic. That will end if, if Lula's elected. I mean, he's not gonna have a really far left-wing government because of all of the compromises he's had to make to get the endorsement of different people in the you know bourgeois elite. But it will be Geopolitically, it would be much better for Latin America in terms of sovereignty of nations to have him in power than to have someone who just, he's the most um, sycophantic Brazilian leader in history to the United States, Jair Bolsonaro. He even visited CIA headquarters after he was elected, the first time a Brazilian president's ever done that. Yes, yes, it's crazy. Let's, uh, let me ask you one last final question. What about the lawfare? Uh, do you think that they will retry those things while in the case Lula wins? Those cases against Lula cannot be retried anymore. I mean, when the media said that it was thrown out on a technicality, they didn't follow through. Uh, the only reason they could call it a technicality is because the Supreme Court ruled that these, these cases had been illegally forum shopped to a sympathetic judge in a jurisdiction that didn't have any, you know, any authority to act on those charges, which 
detailed crimes that were committed in a different state, right? So they recommended that the, if, first of all, they said all of the evidence had to be discarded. There wasn't much evidence to begin with. It was just a, a few coerced plea bargain testimonies. They had to be discarded. And that um, if prosecutors wanted to try and recharge Lula for any of those crimes, it had to happen in Brasilia federal district court, okay? What happened is that on all of the charges, uh, pro public prosecutors attempted to reinitiate the charges in Brasilia, and in every case, they were immediately thrown out for not having any material evidence, because none of these charges ever had material evidence behind them. So, so there's no way he could be tried for any of those frivolous 26 charges that the United States Department of Justice backed Operation Car Wash team, you know, levied against Lula. That's okay. that's done with. They'd have to invent something else. But I think that people are tired of this lawfare now. You know, they, I don't think it. I don't think they'd be able to get anything to stick on him at this point, especially since since the first time they tried to throw out Lula with lawfare over the scandal called the Mensa Lounge, which was equally ridiculous and without any kind of evidence as the Operation Car Wash stuff. Um, from that moment forwards, the Workers' Party has been extra special, uh, extra special, extra careful about making sure they don't do anything illegal because they know they're under like heavy, heavy scrutiny the entire time. You know, they, they have double or triple the level of scrutiny of any other political party. So they, it's not, I mean, I'm not saying there's no corruption with any Workers' Party official, but they're much more careful about it than the other parties, you know? So that's why after years and years of investigation, the best that Operation Car Wash could come up with was one coerced plea bargain testimony of an imprisoned corrupt businessman who got millions of dollars in asset retention and 85% um, sentence reduction in exchange for reading off the script to implicate Lula. He changed his story three times before they let him out of jail. You know, that was the only, the, they did, they threw out Sergio Moro, who was the, he presided over the judge, over the investigation and his own investigation. He said the that they elect him as congressman, yeah. right? He said that yeah, they no, elect- Yeah, he's a senator. Yes, yes, yes. Disgusting. That's but, um, but I mean, he, he rejected 100, over 100 defense witnesses of Lula's. He rejected, I mean, the, if you look into those cases, it's such a, it's such a ridiculous travesty of justice. I don't think they, they're gonna try that again. They might, Good but I don't think it will stick. I think the big problem is that he's gonna have to put, it's gonna be like 2003, 2004 all over again when he was stuck in these IMF conditionality agreements from his predecessor, and he couldn't increase funding uh, on education and health and sanitation until he paid back the IMF loans early. You know, so the first year or two, it's going to be tough because he's, you know, that's my take. It's good. It's good to know that, and it was very good to talk. If to he's you. elected, but let me just say I don't want to jinx. Of course, this, of, course right? of course. Do you do you feel that overconfidence among? Lula supporters, or they are. No, they... I think people are, you know, people might have been a little bit overconfident in the first round because the media made it look like he was going to win in the first round, even though that was based on a misinterpretation of mm. polling numbers that didn't take into account the margin of error. I mean, the big poll said 50%, two point margin of error either way. So we ended up with 58.4 within the margin of error. I mean, the odds were the odds were that he wasn't going to win in the first round, and the media made it look like he was. So that caused some overconfidence. I think people are really worried now, and That's I think good. turnout among the poor and working class is going to be higher in the second round than it was in the first round. That's good to know exactly. That will help mobilization of people if 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 they you know get rid of that overconfidence. Thank you, Ryan. I really enjoyed talking to you. Finally. And, and un abrazo from Caracas. Please be safe. A, a lot, lot of respect for your work. You guys too. I like, I'm a fan of. <laughs>